Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first mini webinar in Colorado Center on Law and Policies, Communities Against Poverty virtual event. Uh, this is Bob Mook. I'm CCLP's Communications Director, and I'm speaking to you live from my home office, and I'll be hosting uh, this particular session. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our presenting sponsor, Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, they are sponsoring this particular webinar. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our supporting sponsors, uh, Colorado Children's Campaign and our fearless leader, uh, Executive Director Tiffany Lennon. Thank you all for your support and your partnership. This session is titled Administrative Barriers to Health Coverage. Over the next 20 minutes, we'll learn about the administrative burdens that get in the way of accessing health care coverage and what CCLP does to lift those burdens. Then our co-host, Christina Yeboa, and uh, Bethany Prey, actually it's Yeboa, right? Right, Christina? Thank you. <laughs> we'll share, together they'll share some closing thoughts and take questions. Um, we will not take questions throughout the webinar. We'll take them at the end and you can submit them through uh, your chat or your Q&A feature on your Zoom. Uh, and we'll, we'll get through them. I'll, I'll kind of curate them at the end um at the end of the session with with all that said i'd like to introduce uh christina and bethany uh christina is a research and policy analyst at cclp uh her expertise is in qualitative research community informed practices cultural competency and health equity uh, she helps cclp's healthcare program identify data points and metrics to evaluate and inform policy and legislation. Uh, she's closing in on our second year with us uh, now. We're, we're very, uh, very honored to have us among, uh, have her among us. And uh, Bethany is our legal director and she's in the midst of her seventh year at CCLP and she works with the staff on setting uh, CCLP's priorities and leading its advocacy work. Her areas of expertise include regulatory analysis and advocacy for Medicaid and commercial pro, uh, coverage, access to behavioral health benefits, Medicaid eligibility and services, particularly for children with disabilities, Medicaid notice and appeals processes, defense of the, the provisions of the Affordable Care Act and operations of Colorado's health insurance exchange. Uh, both of our co-hosts today have impressive credentials, which you can read about on our staff page on our website at cclponline.org. In the interest of time, I'll turn over this session to uh, Christina, and then uh, she'll alternate with Bethany, and uh, then we'll open it up with question, for questions, which again, you can submit through chat or the Q&A feed on Zoom throughout the session. Uh, good afternoon, Christina. Uh, you may want to unmute. Uh, are you ready to get started? I am. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, Bob, if you can flip over, perfect. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to do a little bit of level setting and talk about Medicaid. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Medicaid Act is quite expansive. Um, states that participate, i.e. all of them, <laughs> cover a generous set of services to the extent medically necessary, and almost all people who meet income and other eligibility requirements pay no premiums, have minimal co-pays, and have no deductibles. Um, coverage can even be retroactive, meaning that you can receive coverage for up to three months prior to your application date if you have unpaid medical expenses. The literature is pretty clear that Medicaid works on both the state and an individual level. 
For states that have expanded Medicaid, they tend to have improved outcomes for their populations, including an increased percentage of residents with coverage and econ economic benefits in the form of state budget savings, revenue gains, and just overall growth. On an individual level, compared to those without insurance coverage, those enrolled in Medicaid are more likely to have a doctor's visit and receive specialty care, and they're more likely to report that they have been satisfied with their health care. They're also more likely to have a usual source of care, as in a trusted provider or setting that they visit when they need services. In addition, <clears throat> many see increased financial security and tend to self-report less stress and anxiety levels. And due to better access to care, they have a better chance of detecting a chronic disease and typically experience better health outcomes. This includes decreased maternal and infant mortality rates, uh, which is something close to my heart. Additionally, Medicaid eligibility during childhood has long-term positive impacts, include reduced teen mortality, reduced disability, improved long-run educational attainment, and lower rates of emergency department visits and hospitalizations in later life. It should be noted that although Medicaid is the focus of this presentation, the types of administrative barriers that we're going to be talking about today are relevant to all sorts of programs, ranging from voter registration to social security to food assistance. Uh, next slide, Blob. Awesome. So administrative burdens undermine program benefits, all of which are heightened for people who experience systemic bias. Throughout this presentation, we'll be outlining three types of burdens. The first of which is informational, as in people spending hours trying to figure out where they should go when they need resources or have questions. For example, People may not know that single adults can qualify for Medicaid and that many working families have incomes below the income threshold or may be unable to find or navigate the Medicaid website. Pregnant Coloradans might be unaware that they can get Medicaid or Child Health Plus at much higher income levels. Uh, people may think incorrectly that citizenship is a requirement or they think that owning a home would make them ineligible. Um, all of these can be exacerbated when folks lack digital literacy and as in are inexperienced with technological use or do not have access to internet connection or broadband. Next slide, Bob. Thank you. So the second type um, involves compliance. So here we're focusing on the burdens of enrollment and the maintenance of coverage. Some compliance burdens include one, like on the screen, lengthy applications and sometimes successive re uh, requests for documentation, ranging from pay stubs to visas to medical documents. The second, a lack of in-person assistance, which is vital for people with lower literacy or disabilities or for people with limited English proficiency. Thirdly, problems related to our antiquated benefits management system, which generates duplicative and incorrect notices, uh, uploads incorrect household and income information, and is particularly problematic for non-English speakers. Fourth, dispersed county administration, administration, which compounds the challenges of keeping workers trained on a very complex system. And then lastly, eligibility based on monthly income, which means frequent action and updates are required for members and workers. A lack of action, such as a failure to answer a letter, can result in a loss of coverage. You can contrast that with programs like Social Security, Retirement Income, or Medicaid, which place a, a far fewer burdens on recipients. All right, and the third type of burden is psychological. All Americans are beneficiaries um, of government programs of some sort of um, of some sort over the course of their lives, whether or not that's federal education loans, social security, unemployment, veterans benefits, but it's only in means tested programs for people with lower incomes where additional burdens are applied the most. And it takes time to enroll and stay enrolled and wait on hold, visit county offices, and all of that suggests that people's time is not valuable and can create frustration. Questions about household members, fiscal conditions, bank accounts, and other assets can feel personal and invasive. Imposition of administrative burdens results in programs like Medicaid being harder to administer and more error prone and creates a sense that the government is inefficient. This adds to a perception that the government is not on the side of the person for which the benefit was originally designed for. And with that, I'll hand it over to our legal director, Bethany, to talk a little bit about how CCLP is working towards the vision you see on the screen. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. Um, so, uh, Find my, find my spot here, I apologize. Um, all right, so CCLP's vision is that, um, sorry, I'm just trying to deal with our, our, our question windows here. <clears throat> uh, 
CCPL, CCLP's vision is for a Medicaid system and health kit system generally that treats applicants and members with respect and recognizes the value of their time and importance of their participation while also making timely and accurate determinations around eligibility. Next slide. Uh, CCLP is working to attain that vision using legislative and legal tools, as well as research to identify problems and solutions. We note that many administrative burdens are imposed by the federal government, and CCLP works on that front as well by engaging with national colleagues and submitting comments to proposed federal regulations, but today we're focusing on our state level work. First, CCLP worked to pass the bill, this House Bill 1143 in 2017, sponsored by Representative Landgraf and Senator Crowder that resulted in this year's Medicaid communications audit and is developing suggestions for how to address the high error rate found in that audit. Um, 67 out of 100 notices sampled had errors. We're really pleased that the state will soon be launching an effort to oversee eligibility processes at the county level and will include notices in their reviews. Improved notices can reduce the compliance burdens that Christina spoke about and make it easier to get and stay enrolled. CCLP addresses problems that we or community partners or affected individuals identify, such as in the past year, inappropriate denials based on immigration status, eligibility hurdles for home health services, failure to, to initially provide continuing coverage for a subset of employees during the COVID public health emergency, that's up to um, you know, 50,000 folks who might've lost coverage. And to clearly lay out how enrollees would be treated post-emergency, as well as work on a maternity program that had potential to deepen existing racial disparities for women of color. Those issues involve all three types of burdens that Christina described, informational, compliance, and psychological. We help resolve those problems through collaboration. At times, this may look like more of a wrestling match, admittedly, uh, with the state that can yield significant changes in state rules and policy and restoration of benefits. Next slide. CCLP works to attain that vision outside of Medicaid as well. CCLP led the passage of House Bill 12, uh, 1236 last year, sponsored by representatives Lantine and Will and Senators Tate and Bridges, which will make it easier for people to enroll in subsidized coverage through Connect for Health Colorado by allowing them to use the state tax filing process to find out whether they're eligible for a subsidized plan or public coverage. That helps overcome the information burden I mentioned earlier. So rather than having to have background information on, on what they might be eligible for, they can opt into getting um, information from the exchange to hear more about that. Second, CCLP worked for changes in the state's standardized application for health insurance so that Coloradans, regardless of immigration status, could enroll in health coverage. The former um, application posed both compliance and psychological burdens on Colorado residents who wanted to take care of their family's health needs and were willing to pay full price to get covered. That former application required information that non-citizens could not supply, even though by all other standards, they were eligible. We provided extensive comments on the Colorado Indigent Care Program with a goal of reducing documentation and application burdens on Coloradans who qualify for reduced hospital costs. And we've helped community members throughout Colorado understand how federal immigration changes affect or don't affect their eligibility for benefits. Again, that uh, was an enormous information burden um, that, that needed um, a lot of work to, uh, to address. And now for our future work. We're gonna be continuing this work to, to reduce administrative burdens in the coming months. Um, we'll continue our work with the state on a new consolidated return mail center. Now, much of this sounds very technical, but it has a, has a significant impact on, on members. There's a small unit that's going to be in, that is currently getting stood up in Prowers County that will be tasked with managing all returned mail for Colorado benefits programs. They're starting with Medicaid recipients in three counties. 
we have serious concerns about termination of benefits occurring when a single piece of mail is returned and we'll be advocating that no terminations occur if the person has, has been accessing services or until the state has coordinated with providers or other Medicaid entities to get updated addresses. We have a lot of concerns that's not being done currently. Especially now during the pandemic, people may have moved, lost housing, doubled up with others, or lost internet access that they need to update and address. So this is a, a, a tough time to be implementing this program and we are gonna be working on trying to make sure it works more smoothly so that a single piece of returned mail will not result in termination of benefits. We're also working with other advocates to ensure that when the public health emergency is lifted, the right now 350,000 Coloradans who have been maintained due to the emergency get their eligibility reassessed. They may have become eligible again, even if they weren't for some period during the emergency. And that they're given the opportunity to demonstrate that they remain eligible. We support healthcare policy and financing's request to the federal government that they be given more time to undertake those complex, important processes after the emergency is lifted. Um, and we're, we're hoping for three to six months additional time so that that can be done really uh, carefully. Third, we're gonna to continue to fight to ease access to behavioral health services and improve parity in Colorado Medicaid. We recognize that this will be a major challenge with the current fiscal crisis. And last, we will advocate with partners, Connect for Health, Healthcare Policy and Financing, and our state legislature for coverage and affordability programs that are available to all residents that are understandable and easy to use and where administrative burdens are reduced. Thank you. So um, we're, I think we're gonna open up for questions. Um, I don't actually see any in the um, Q and A box um, or in the, the list in the um, chat box. But uh, if, if um, anyone has any now, we'd, we'd love to entertain those. I apologize about the dog. All right, we have one question, Bethany. Does Colorado have a buy-in program? Is that something CCLP will work on? Um, that's a good question. So we we have a we have we do have buy-in programs for adults with disabilities and for children with disabilities that involve um, a monthly premium and and slightly different eligibility standards. Um, we um, you know the 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 state is looking at different sorts of state or public options. Um, and we are definitely working on that with other um, advocates to make sure that um, whatever option is proposed is affordable, is open. At this time, I'm gonna say that a, um, a buy-in to Medicaid um, as you know, if that were the form of the state option, um, that this would be a very tough year for it as would next year um, because of our budget constraints. It's likely to involve state dollars. Um, and I think that the, the, the administration is more likely to be looking at, at uh, programs that don't involve state dollars. Okay, I have a, we have a question from uh, Don Burns, um, co-founder co of the uh, Burns Institute of Policy Research at CCLP. He wanted to know how, uh, what the two of you feel about health care for all. Well, I, I mean, I think this as a, th there are sort of two ways to answer that. One is, um, do I, what do I think about its viability currently? Um, and like I was saying, I think the budget makes that discussion hard. And I also think that having federal um, leadership on this is really important because um, even with a, um, you know, a state, a state 
plan that provided health care for all that had minimum minimal um, administrative burden um, would still have to mesh with the existing federal programs. Um, mesh, and that was actually one of the obstacles the last time this was being discussed seriously a few years ago in the, uh, by the legislature. Um, it has to work with Medicaid, it has to work with Medicaid, it has to, to work with um, TRICARE um, veterans benefits. Um, so it, there's, it's, it's complicated if it's not coming from a federal direction. Uh, so I think it's, you know, while we would love to have um, something that was more as expansive as possible and as um, administratively simple as possible, both for the state and for um, enrollees, um, I think the, um, you know, we're going to be working on as many fronts as possible right now. So making what we have work better um, and um, preventing future problems, and then also trying to pave the way for something that is that is broader. I hope that answers it. Christine, if you have more to add. No, I don't think I have much more to add. I did want to go to a comment by Mary. I believe that this was in reference to the buy-in programs. Um, she's curious about whether or not it seems like this could be a national model for other states. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Colorado has had some really innovative uh, health related legislation in the last few years. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'll name like the easy enrollment bill that, that Allison Neswood led for us last year. Um, we are the second state to have done that. Um, the, um, the, the health insurance fee bill that sets up affordability programs that are, that are available to more folks that's also innovative. I think we are the first to have done it quite that way. So I, other states are looking at what Colorado is doing in this area. Um, Washington stood theirs up last, this, this is the first year for it. Um, so we have some lessons we can learn from them. Um, but it's, um, um, you know, I think it, it's true. I think one thing we wanna do is we do wanna be a model in some ways too and hope that what we do that works well can be replicated. We have a very good question here. Uh, either one of you can take a crack at it, but uh, what do you, it's from a Colorado Safety Net Collaborative. What do you see as the most important changes that might be upcoming in either regulation or in the legislature in the next year? So, I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna say that, that issues related to COVID are really gonna to have to be top of the list this year. Um, so one of the issues in regulation is gonna be how people are treated who have been kept on Medicaid due to COVID um, so that we don't see sudden widespread losses. So I said there were 350,000 people now. We, we do expect that the emergency is gonna be extended in January. And today on a national call, I heard it might get extended one additional time. Um, but that means we would end up with a locked in population of a lot more than 350,000. So how that population is treated at the end is going to be really important. And that's often in rule. Um, so we need to, we're, we're going to be making sure that, that, um, that, that the rules say, continue to say that before anyone can lose coverage for any reason, they have to be, uh, their eligibility for all of the programs has to be considered and um, um, they have to get a notice and have the opportunity to appeal. Uh, the other um, important changes that are coming are gonna be implementation of the HIF bill and implementation of easy enrollment. Um, you know, I think we all get really excited when we pass bills and it's, uh, it's a great accomplishment, but then we have to make sure that they're implemented properly and that takes everybody's continued work. Um, and then for the legislature in this coming year, um, I mean, I'm, I'm I think the budget is a big, big issue. Um, call, uh, Medicaid brings in a lot of funding, um, a lot of federal funding. So it would be very short-sighted for the state to um, reduce the state spend on Medicaid um, when what we're really losing is twice as much money. We're losing um, the federal match as well. Um, and so there might be opportunities to increase our federal match in some ways. Um, so we're gonna be thinking about that as well. Um, we have, the, other, the other big change, actually, I don't know, or maybe Christina will talk more about this. Um, we, we, we need to make um, it possible to do 
constructive work in the area of um, health disparities and racial equity. And there is a, there's a lot of movement in that direction, but making it, um, actualizing that is, is gonna be a big piece of work for this year, both legislatively and administratively. And Christina, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, so I think one large emphasis that CCLP has been working on recently and is going to be incredibly imperative um, that health systems across the board improve on is disaggregated data by race and ethnicity. Um, we have to make sure that we're doing our due diligence across all systems, uh, collecting enough information to be able to identify what the health disparities are on the basis of race and ethnicity. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, capturing patient experience in this whole um, and the current climate that we have right now. And then additionally to that, I was gonna say some changes that are going on with primary care as well. Um, because of the pandemic, a lot of people are um, experiencing even more barriers to receiving um, access to care, especially for primary care. And so we're seeing quite a few of primary care settings struggling with financial solvency. Um, and so, you know, making sure that we're investing in primary care um, is gonna be really imperative in this upcoming year. Great. We have a couple more really good questions, and then we'll uh, we'll start winding it down. Um, Natasha asks uh, about the budget and how that will affect individuals that already have Medicaid or uh, people who are uh, new applicants, new or the the newly applied. So, um, what one of the the so the budget as it is does not have cuts that would directly disenroll anyone from Medicaid um, because of the budget shortfalls. The, the proposed budget would reduce um, uh, revenue for hospitals um, and um, it, it doesn't really help that much with well, it doesn't do a lot to get providers back into a better position who have, who have, as Christina was describing, lost a lot of revenue in the last year. So primary care outpatient benefits. Um, we're, we're concerned about um, cuts to behavioral health um, that will, uh, you know, potentially make it harder for people to access behavioral health benefits. There, it's, you know, it's still, that picture is emerging but there are cuts from in the Department of Human Services. And then there are also um, some, some uh, changes at HICPUF to slow down the rollout, for example, of the residential and inpatient su substance use disorder benefit. So people have to wait longer for that. Um, the other thing that's uh, been, been talked about is the reduction in dental, the dental benefit. So dental services are optional for adults. States don't have to provide them. Um, Colorado has provided a limited benefit for adults. And um, last year's uh, bill in 2020 reduced that further. So it's maxed out at $1,000 um, per year for adult dental. Um, if you have more complicated work, that's not gonna be sufficient. But that can't go into place based on the language of the bill until the additional federal match we got from the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, until that higher match of 6.2% goes away, that, that benefit can't be reduced. So um, the state may want to reduce it, but we are going to be pointing out that they can't, if that comes up. So um, there aren't gonna be really direct impacts on people who, are, who have Medicaid or are applying. Um, except also on the county administration side where, um, you know, currently county offices are very taxed to uh, be able to provide services because of the pandemic. Great. Uh, one more question from Laura Ware. Uh, does CCLP work on advocacy that involves uh, those who are on Medicare and Medicaid? I believe she's referring to uh, dual eligibles. Yeah, we, we do some work, um, our partners, Colorado Legal Services, um, who we work really closely with, uh, have a lot of um, um, expertise in, in that population. And um, we, we partner with them on some issues. We're working on something right now where there's been a problem with people who get Medicaid, um, their, med their Medicare premiums paid by Medicaid. So we're helping resolve that, that issue by working with the administration. So we do some work, but um, we, we do rely on their expertise. 
Great. Um, hey, thanks. Thanks, the two of you. Um, can everybody hear me? We can hear you, Bob. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, I couldn't tell if I was muted or not. Uh, Thanks so much. Uh, if anyone has questions for Bethany or Christina, I've I've listed their uh, uh, email addresses. So contact them anytime. We're we're here to serve you. Or we're all here to serve you. Um, and we're sort of winding down the presentation here, uh, kind of teeing up for. Tomorrow, uh, we will begin with, uh, actually, we have another webinar coming at five o'clock from uh, uh, Sarah uh, Lipowitz on food insecurity and insecure times, for insecure times. So uh, tune in or dial in to that uh, at five o'clock today. Um, tomorrow, we have yet another webinar at nine o'clock with uh, Jack Regenbogen. He's our he's our uh, senior attorney here. Uh, it's on uh, protecting tenants' rights during the pandemic, and then uh, a real treat for everyone: the uh, a keynote address from uh, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the uh, St. Louis Post Dispatch, Tony Messenger. Um, he won a Pulitzer Prize for his work about debtors' prisons in Missouri, and he's kind of looking at the issue nationwide. Uh, the The name of the keynote is "Price of Poverty: Story of Profit, uh, Profit and uh, Abuse in the Name of Justice." Four o'clock, we'll have a uh, happy hour. Actually, I believe that's uh, that might be at five o'clock. Let me double check that. <laughs> Uh, but that will be uh, uh, that will be hosted with some of the, the fun-loving folks here at, and very effective, smart folks here at CCLP. Uh, kind of bring in a little bit of the uh, social aspect of uh, this event that uh, might be lost in a virtual event as compared to a real live event. Um, day uh, day three, uh, that's Saturday. Well, we'll uh, preview our lived experience project video. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty fun project. You can currently check it out on YouTube, but we uh, will have some more uh, commentary on that. Then we're previewing the State of Working Colorado report from 11 to 11.45. We'll, we'll be wind, winding down the event at noon on Saturday with a message from uh, our executive director, Tiffany Lennon. And, uh, you know, we structured this in sort of bite-sized pieces um, throughout the throughout the three-day period. Um, we'll post everything on our YouTube channel, by the way. So any pieces that you might miss, you you could easily access um, through uh, social media, through YouTube. Um, we'll have a dedicated landing page for this on our website. Um, and in closing here, uh, I'd like to give a, another shout out to the sponsors of this uh, webinar, uh, Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, Colorado Children's Campaign, and Tiffany Lennon. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, all the sponsors for the Communities Against Poverty event. Um, we are showing all of our presenting sponsors here and our supporting sponsors here. Shout out to all of them. Thank you again for your support. Uh, those of you viewing out there, uh, check out our website at cclponline.org. Learn more about our organization and uh, what we do and how you can support us. Uh, we'll see some of you in a, about another hour and a half for the food security session. Uh, if not, thank you. Have a pleasant day. And